Day 268 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Well, you were looking at a girl who slept by her toilet last night after getting bit by a violent stomach bug that made its way through my entire household. I was trying to hold off and speaking life over myself for the past couple of days, just praying that I wouldn't get it, but I did. And it's okay because God is good. And it's never by our own strength that we get anything done anyway, because as much as I wanted to sit in my bed all day long, I was like, no, I have got to practice what I preach. So here we are, not by might, not by power, but by His Spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if you want to just say a little prayer, I know you guys are getting this in the future, but I believe God hears future prayers as well. And so I am still making my way out of it. Definitely not feeling 100%, still a bit queasy. So hopefully I can at least make it through this recording and we'll be able to get you a video today. So we are back in the book of Ezra today, where we officially meet Ezra, because if you remember, for the first six chapters, the temple was being built, it was being dedicated, and it got finished. And so now we are going to fast forward about 60 years. So between chapter six and chapter seven, there's a 60 year span. And Ezra, if you remember, he's a priest and a scribe, and he is leading now the societal and spiritual revival of Jerusalem after the rebuilding of the temple. Now, the reason why Holly took us through the book of Esther before this is because because we are now in the reign of Artaxerxes, who is Esther's husband. And so that was the best place to put it chronologically. So we are reading from the ESV by Crossway translation today. But before we get started, we would love it if you could please help us out by hitting that thumbs up button. That's your roll call button if you're part of the Heart Dive family, or if you're just kind of starting to join us on the daily. And if you are in agreement with what we're doing here, that is your way to just kind of give back a little bit. And if you're subscribed to the channel, that's also helpful. Make sure you got that notification bell on so that you know when the videos come out each day because you know they don't come out at the same time. And if you're new to this Bible study, you're just popping in, we welcome you here. Make sure to take a look at the show notes or the description box. That's right below the video. You'll have to click on the word more to be able to expand the description box out. And there you're going to find a lot of information about this Bible study. I do have a link to all of my Bible notes if you think that that will be helpful in following along, but lots of other things in there as well. Link to our website, heartdive.com org, link to our Facebook group where we schedule out online fellowship meetings with some of our volunteers. So we just love what God is doing around here. So we're going to go ahead and pray and jump on in. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Lord, we thank you that even when we are weak, you are strong. Your strength is perfected in weakness. And so I just pray that be the case here today. Holy Spirit, I need you. I just pray for a special anointing, Lord, that it will not be my words, but yours. And I just pray that you will be seen through everything today. Oh God, thank you so much for this word. And I pray that it will do what you have intended for it to do, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to be able to help us to live out this life, this journey of life that we are living out here on this earth. And so we thank you, Holy Spirit, for being in our midst today. Please forgive us for our sins. We just ask that you will start to do something within us right now. Every day is an opportunity to grow, to become better. And so we just open up ourselves to you to be able to do that. Have your way in our hearts today. Lord, cleanse us where necessary. I pray that you will point things out that we may need to fix. I pray that you will encourage us in places that we may be weary or discouraged. More than anything, may you get the glory in all things, from the words that we speak, the actions that we do, through the people that we meet, the conversations we have. We just want to be able to glorify you. We love you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we start off here in chapter 7, verse 1. Now after this, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra, the son of Sareah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Mareoth, son of Zerahiah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eliezer, son of Aaron, the chief priest. So before we move any further, I just wonder how many of y'all skipped over that part really quickly, you know, just kind of skimmed over it because you're like, I don't know these names. I don't know how to pronounce them even in my brain. So we're just going to look at it and pass on by. Well, well, that's pretty easy to do, right? With all genealogy. And we have kind of gone through this when we went through the book of Numbers. But I always think it's important to stop and ask ourselves, why did God feel it was so important to introduce Ezra this way? Well, for one, it's establishing his authority as a priest by tracing his lineage all the way back to the Levitical and priestly house of Aaron. And even in hearing this, it may still feel very wah, 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 right? Because it doesn't apply to us. But I bet 
that there were people back then who heard this and they would look at Ezra's lineage and they would start pointing fingers. They would say, well, you know what that grandfather did or you know how bad that cousin was possibly trying to disqualify him. And we can even do that to ourselves, you know, in the way that we think that we don't have the most significant background or the most prominent family. And therefore we don't have this leg up in society or in the ranks of heaven. But what I think that God wants us to see is that our lineage is traced back to Him through Jesus. That is the only heritage we really need to be concerned about. Whenever we see our lineage in Christ, we will be able to celebrate when we have amazing people in our families, but we can also celebrate the mercy of God on our lives if we've got a bunch of deadbeats behind us, right? Because we are not tied to that. We are tied to God Almighty. Our heritage comes from Him through Jesus. So heart check. How would you be introduced? How can you link your family and heritage back to God? How does this change your outlook on your own life? Verse six, this Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel had given and the king granted him all that he asked for the hand of the Lord, his God was on him. So that means he had favor with both God and the king. And there went up also to Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the king, some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants. And Ezra came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which is July, August, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first day of the first month, which is March, April, he began to go up from Babylonia. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem for the good hand of his God was on him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. So this was a good four month journey. And remember, scribes aren't just these glorified secretaries. You know, they were experts in the law and in the word of the Lord, meaning they were probably more like lawyers. They intensely studied preserved, taught, administered the word. So in a sense, they were also prophetic in the way that they exhorted and encouraged through the existing word. But what I love most about Ezra is how it says in verse 10 that he set his heart to study the law, meaning he knew he had a purpose and he did something about it. He was prepared for the job, but guess when he did all that studying? He did it while he was in exile. He decided to use that time wisely and to sharpen his skills instead of pouting and complaining about what he didn't have or how things weren't going the way that he wanted them to. So whenever God finally tapped him on the shoulder and sent him out, he was ready. And sometimes we will have those seasons of exile where we feel like we are so far from our end goal, or we may feel like we are lacking the resources, or we don't have anyone to support or champion us in our endeavors. You may even be experiencing setbacks at every turn currently. But I say, take heart, you know, do what you can to sharpen your skills in those seasons so that whenever God says to move out, you will be ready. Because if you really think about it, we are all in a season of exile, awaiting the next season. There is always something that God is preparing us for. So heart check, how are you preparing for the next journey God will send you on? And if you don't have any verses highlighted in your Bible. I hope that you at least take note, write some notes on verse 10 here. The fact that he set his heart, meaning he intentionally did this. He sought it out. It wasn't just something that came to him. He studied the law of the Lord. He did it, which really is the most important part, not just storing up the knowledge, but being doers of the word and then teaching his statutes and rules in Israel. Now, a lot of people get stuck on the teaching part because they're like, I don't have all the knowledge to be able to teach. I didn't go to seminary. I didn't do Bible college. And I'm like, I didn't either. But God still called me to do this. And I hesitated in the beginning. You guys know this if you've been with me from the beginning to say that I'm a teacher. Because of course, with that word teaching the word, there comes a whole lot of controversy. But the thing we've got to realize is that teaching the word of God isn't always standing at a pulpit. It isn't 
holding or facilitating a Bible study, we all are teachers through our actions, right? I mean, we are constantly showing people God's word in the way that we live. So that middle part, the do it is the most important part, being obedient and faithful, setting an example for others. I mean, I've even known a lot of people in the ministry who didn't know the word of God, who didn't even live the word of God out, you know? So the first two steps are the most important steps. A lot of people want to skip to the teacher part and have that position and that authority, but they're not willing to actually set their heart and study and do the word first. I'm telling you, like, if you want to be a world changer, one of the best ways that you're going to be able to do that is by teaching people God's word. This right here is life changing. And I guarantee you that the things that you are doing currently, these are the things that he's going to use in the next season. I mean, the other day I texted Holly. I was like, hey, Holly, do you think you can make a frame for our Zoom interviews so that it's not just a Zoom picture? Uh, you know, whenever we post the video, we can actually have like a branded uh, heart dive kind of frame over the picture. And she's like, yeah, I've been doing these things since 2017 or something like that. She was saying, man, this is so awesome because we see how God prepared me for this moment moment. Everything that I have been doing up to this point is now being poured into heart dive. And I just love how God does that. You know, he did it with me too. Like prior to this, before moving to Las Vegas, I was a TV show host, you know, and whenever I worked on that TV show, I had to learn how to edit video. I had to understand what it meant to do look live interviews, meaning we weren't necessarily broadcasting live, but we were filming as though we were live. And so that's kind of like what we do here, right? It was all preparation for this season. So God's preparing you for something. Verse 11. Now this is a copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, a man learned in matters of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. So this this letter would kind of be like their passport so that when they would go on this four month dangerous journey, if they were approached by anyone, they could say, hey, you know what? We're on king's orders. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, peace. This is declaring their treaty relationship here. And now I make a decree that any one of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors, and these seven counselors would be kind of like his supreme court, to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and also to carry the silver and gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all the silver and gold that you shall find in the whole province of Babylonia, and with the freewill offerings of the people and the priests that vowed willingly for the house of their God that is in Jerusalem. With this money then... So he's not just going on his own here. I mean, he is sent by the king to be able to gather information for him, to be able to strengthen the province. And so if you think about it, this may have had a little bit of political motivation on behalf of King Artaxerxes, because for him, he needs to strengthen that area that lies between his land and Egypt so that it would benefit his kingdom. Verse 17, and with this money, then you shall with all diligence buy bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and you shall offer them on the altar of the house of your God that is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do according to the will of your God. The vessels that have been given you for the service of the house of your God, you shall deliver before the God of Jerusalem. And whatever else is required for the house of your God, which it falls to you to provide, you may provide it out of the king's treasury. So he's basically giving him like a royal debit card or a petty cash fund. If you kind of grew up knowing what a petty cash fund is, he has access to the royal treasury. And I, Artaxerxes the king, make a decree to all the treasurers in the province beyond the river. Whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven requires of you, let it be done with all diligence up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil and salt without prescribing how much. So he does have spending limits. Like he can't just go spend all the money. Whatever is decreed by the God of heaven, let it be done in full for the house of the God of heaven lest his wrath be against the realm of the king and his sons. We also notify you that it shall not be lawful to impose tribute. So, a.k.a. 
no taxing them. So now we are seeing this implementation of the tax exempt status for the priests. It's biblical. Custom or toll or any one of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the doorkeepers, the temple servants, or other servants of this house of God. Verse 25, and you, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God that is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges who may judge all the people in the province beyond the river, all such as know the laws of your God. And those who do not know them, you shall teach. So not only is he being given the authority to teach the people the word of God, but he's also being given the authority to create like a judicial system to be able to not only teach, but also punish justly. Whoever will not obey the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be strictly executed on him, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of his goods or for imprisonment. And now we see Ezra's renewed vigor here in verse 27, blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to beautify the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. I was actually studying this as I was listening to Holly's teaching on Esther, and she talked about that beautification of ourselves, right? Uh, but we have seen throughout the years a lot of criticism, you know, of the beautification of the church, the grandeur of the buildings and the temples. But here we see like God really did have a heart not only to build his temple, but to make it beautiful. But where it becomes a problem is whenever that beautification becomes the focus and not God. But whenever we look at our own lives and our own holy temples, it did make me wonder, you know, how much we do consider the beautification of our own temples. Because many of us are just kind of trying to keep our head above water and we're just merely surviving. I'm over here trying not to chuck up, you know, but God wants us to live in a temple that truly exemplifies his beauty and glory. And this beauty goes well beyond the physical and it radiates from within. So heart check. Does your temple reflect the beauty of God? Do you feel as though beauty exudes from the overflow of your heart? What areas may need some gentle repairs? So he continues here in verse 28, and who extended to me his steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers, I took courage for the hand of the Lord, my God was on me. And I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So he recognizes the favor, the hand of God that is upon his life. It is not boastful to say, I am blessed and highly favored when you know where that favor comes from and you give the glory back to God. And that's exactly what Ezra is doing. He could have easily thought that this favor was because of his charisma, and it was just simply because of the way that he was so great, and therefore the king gave him this favor, but he knew better. And so now here in chapter eight, we take a look at some of the details of this four-month journey and some of the people who returned with Ezra. Verse one, these are the heads of their father's houses. And this is the genealogy of those who went up with me from Babylonia in the reign of Artaxerxes, the king of the sons of Phinehas, Gershom of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel of the sons of David, Hattish of the sons of Shechaniah, who was of the sons of Perosh, Zechariah, with whom were registered 150 men of the sons of Peath Moab. Elihoenai, Hoenai, the son of Zerahiah, and with him 200 men. Of the sons of Zatu, Shechaniah, the son of Jehaziel, and with him 300 men. Of the sons of Aden, Ebed, the son of Jonathan, and with him 50 men. Of the sons of Elam, Jesheah, the son of Adaliah, and with him 70 men. Of the sons of Shephatiah, Zebediah, the son of Michael, and with him 80 men. Of the sons of Joab, Obadiah, the son of Jehiel, and with him 218 men. Of the sons of Bani, Shelomith, the son of Josephiah, and with him 160 men. Of the sons of Bebai, Zechariah, the son of Bebai, and with him 28 men. Of the sons of Asgad, Johanan, the son of Hakatan, and with him 110 men. Of the sons of Adonikam, those who came later with their names being Eliphalet, Jeuel, and Shemaiah, and with them 60 men. Of the sons of Bigvi, Utai, and and Zachar, and with them, 70 men. So if you are a person who likes to add up the math, I believe it comes out to 1496, which remember, these are just the men, the heads of the 
families. And so there were likely six to 7,000 if you're going to include the women and children who went with them. Verse 15, now I gathered them to the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped for three days. And as I reviewed the people and the priests, I found they're none of the sons of Levi. So isn't that interesting that the Levites were typically a lot more than the priests? But again, we are seeing that inverse, that there are no Levites with them. Why did the Levites not come? Well, probably because they were comfortable in their life in Babylon. They may have actually enjoyed this sort of newfound freedom that they had while in exile of not being under the priest's authority, or perhaps they just didn't know their purpose. I mean, it's been 70 years of exile, so a whole generation and a half went by. But nevertheless, he ain't going to accept it. Verse 16, Then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jareb, Elnathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and Meshullam, leading men, and for Joyarib and Elnathan, who were men of insight, and sent them to Ido, the leading man at the place of Kesiphia, telling them what to say to Ido and his brothers and the temple servants at the place Kesiphia, namely to send us ministers for the house of our God. So he's putting together this recruitment task force to go back and get them some Levites because this is why he knows that he needs the Levites there to help them minister at the temple. I mean, this was their commissioning work to teach the people the word of God, and he knew that that was part of his commissioning, and he would need them to help him carry that out. Verse 18, And by the good hand of our God on us, they brought us a man of discretion, of the sons of Malai, the son of Levi, son of Israel, namely Sherebiah, with his sons and kinsmen, 18. Also Hashabiah, and with him Jesheah, of the sons of Merari, with his kinsmen and their sons, 20. Besides 220 of the temple servants whom David and his officials had set apart to attend the Levites. These were all mentioned by name. Now, we don't want to be like this. We don't want to be like the Levites who have to wait to be called upon, have to wait to be recruited to go out and do the work of God. Like the heart of God's people really should be how can I help? How can I serve? How can I volunteer? And you will find that the more you begin to do stuff like that, the more you begin to serve others and be generous and give of yourself to other people, you will see that your life will drastically improve. Your attitude will change, especially if you are doing it under the confines of God's word and his command. Verse 21, and then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. So they knew they needed the protection of God. They needed a supernatural divine protection. And therefore, they are going that extra mile to not only pray for it communally, but also to fast for it. Because sometimes there are certain things that need fasting in order for it to be carried out or to be granted. I and mean, you got to remember, you know, if you've ever done a fast or maybe not done a fast, sometimes people think, oh, I'm going to do this fast so that I can lose a couple of pounds here. But if you don't have these two aspects here, humbling ourselves and seeking from him. So if you don't have humility and prayer that couple with that fast, that fast is just a diet. That's all it is. So there's got to be humility and there's got to be prayer that accompanies it. But you know, a lot of us, we treat God like he's a fast food drive through instead. Like we just pop in when we need something and pop back out. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, ah, oh, the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So because he expressed such great confidence in God, he didn't want to go against that by asking the king to give him soldiers for protection. You know, he's like, I got to stand by my word. I got to practice what I preach. And the thing is, is that on these kinds of journeys, you know, there were a bunch of robbers, there were a bunch of bandits who were out there waiting to take advantage of people who were passing through with all kinds of goods. And there were no state troopers along the way, you know, to be able to protect them. So this is why he knew they had to ask for that protection. Verse 23, so we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. And I was just talking to my sister yesterday, and I was going to mention to her 
I think we need to fast for this because we're going through, through some things in our family. And, you know, a lot of the time we deeply desire to fast, but actually getting ourselves to that point and into that headspace of actually doing it is a whole different story. But Ezra and his men knew how incredibly important it was to do everything possible to make sure that they were covered. And therefore, they put their resolve to fast into action. So our problem is not goal setting, but rather execution of the goals. So heart check. Is there anything you have resolved to do that you need to now execute? Verse 24, then I set apart 12 of the leading priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and 10 of their kinsmen with them. And I weighed out to them the silver and the gold and the vessels, the offering for the house of our God that the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel there present had offered. I weighed out into their hand 650 talents of silver and silver vessels worth 200 talents and 100 talents of gold, 20 bowls of gold worth 1,000 derricks and two vessels of fine bright bronze as precious as as gold. And I said to them, you are holy to the Lord and the vessels are holy and the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord, the God of your fathers. Guard them and keep them until you weigh them before the chief priests and the Levites and the heads of fathers' houses in Israel at Jerusalem within the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites took over the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem to the house of our God. Now, I don't know if you realize how much this actually is, but if you remember one talent, just one talent of silver would weigh about 66 pounds. And so if you've got 650 talents, that is 43,276 pounds or 21 tons. Or if you want to look at it in a real world example, that's like six orcas. Like that is a lot of silver that they were carrying. And then some, I mean, that was just the first number I picked off. Verse 31, then we departed from the river Ahava on the 12th day of the first month to go to Jerusalem. So if you remember, if you recall that chapter seven said the first day is when they departed. Well, the reason why this discrepancy may be is because they may have actually assembled at the river on day one. So that may be the day one that is being spoken of in chapter seven. And then they perhaps camped for three days, enlisted the Levites for a couple of days, prayed and fasted, gave the load to the priests and the Levites for the next eight days before they actually departed from the river on day 12. So day one was when they got to the river. Day 12 was when they left the river. So the hand of our God was on us. So he was there guiding them, protecting them, blessing them. And he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and from ambushes, by the way. We came to Jerusalem and there we remained three days. On the fourth day within the house of our God, the silver and the gold and the vessels were weighed into the hands of Miramoth, the priest, son of Uriah. And with him was Eliezer, the son of Phinehas. And with them were the Levites, Josabad, the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah, the son of Binuai. The whole was counted and weighed and the weight of everything was recorded. So here we see accountability at play. You know, however the offerings weighed in at the beginning of the journey, they would now need to be be the same whenever they arrived. So in other words, their integrity was being put to the test. And we see in the Bible how stewardship of money and the way that we handle it is often indicative of how we will handle greater responsibility. So we will all give account one day for the way that we handled every gift, both material and spiritual. So heart check, what has God entrusted you with? How well do you steward it? Does it reflect your ability to hold greater responsibility? Verse 35, at that time, those who had come from captivity, the returned exiles, offered burnt offerings to the God of Israel, 12 bulls for all of Israel, 96 rams, 77 lambs, and as a sin offering, 12 male goats. So the 12s here represent the fact that all tribes are represented in this offering. And these burnt offerings were for their general sin and to show dedication. And then the 77, I'm not sure what that means, but it could perhaps imply like this perfection, right? Seven is a number of perfection or completion. And so 77 could be representative of that. So all this was a burnt offering to the Lord. They also delivered the king's commissions, meaning the authorization to administer the Jewish law to the kings, satraps, and to the governors of the province beyond the river, and they aided the people and the house of God. So these satraps were positions of high power in the various regions, and 
if we look here that they aided the people, I mean, that was their main purpose. Their main purpose was to go in and help. So they're not going to be walking into Jerusalem and being like, the king sent us and we've got all of these wonderful things that we need to do. No, they were there to be servants, to be aides, to be helpful in everything that they did. And so now we fast forward about four months later here into chapter nine with their journey completed. Verse one, after these things had been done, the officials approached me and said, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with their abominations from the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians and the Amorites. So these officials are bringing bad news to Ezra. I mean, this was the real issue here. The fact that they were tied to people with their abominations, meaning their idolatry. For they have taken some of their daughters to be wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has mixed itself with the peoples of the lands. And in this faithlessness, the hand of the officials and chief men has been foremost. So the chief men or the leaders, they were leading the people in the wrong direction. As soon as I heard this, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled the hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. So he goes right into mourning. Then all who trembled at the words of God of Israel because of the faithlessness of the returned exiles gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. And the reason why he's appalled is because this is the very thing that got them exiled in the first place. So he's like, why? Like, you guys have just returned from exile. Why are you continuing to live the way that you lived before we got kicked out of here? And at the evening sacrifice, so this would be around 3 p.m., I rose from my fasting with my garment and my cloak torn and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God. So he goes from mourning to now praying and notice his posture being upon his knees with his hands stretched out. While this is not required prayer posture, obviously being modeled as a good one, many people in the Bible prayed on their knees. You know, we had Solomon praying on his knees, the psalmist, Daniel, the people were on their knees before Jesus. We had Stephen, Peter, Paul, Jesus himself prayed on his knees. And so being on your knees, this represents like a humble respect. And also it helps you to actually focus on God when you're on your knees and to not get distracted because anytime you're on your knees, it's not the most pleasant position to be in. You know, it's a little painful. Some people can't even do it and that's fine. So you don't have to, but if you can, it is a good position to pray in. And then your hands spread out, that shows surrender and that you know that everything, every gift comes from God. Now, I also want to point out here that the problem with interracial marriage here in the Bible in this time was not necessarily about race itself. You've got to look at the spirit of the law. The reason why they were not allowed to marry other people was the same reason why we are told in the New Testament not to yoke yourself with unbelievers. Because ultimately what will happen is there will be this constant friction and more than likely the one who is a believer will be sucked into whatever the other person is doing rather than the other way around. It's kind of like what we were talking about the other day, whenever you encounter a sick person, like the healthy person is more likely to get sick than the sick person to get healthy from the healthy person, right? So that was a problem. And the reason why the enemy was so hell bent on getting people to marry outside of their own nation is because he probably figured that if he could get the genealogy so diluted that perhaps the Messiah would never be able to be born. Well, sorry, devil, because God's word is God's word and it endures and you can't change that. Because we know that God's prophecy will never be thwarted. So same goes for us. You know, whatever God spoke over our lives, the devil cannot change that. So here Ezra goes and prays. Oh my God, I am ashamed and I blush to lift my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has mounted up to the heavens. So he's ashamed to be here at the throne of mercy again, having to ask for mercy. But notice that he is linking himself to the people. He's not sitting over there pointing at their mistakes. He's saying our. So he knows that he is bound by that covenant. So he is a big part of it. Verse seven, from the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we are kings and our priests have been given into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plundering and to utter shame as it is today. But now for a brief moment, Moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us a remnant and to give us a secure hold within his holy place. 
that our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. For we are all slaves, yet our God has not forsaken us in our slavery, but has extended to us his steadfast love before the kings of Persia to grant us some reviving to set up the house of our God, to repair its ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. So obviously appealing to God's mercy and his protection that's been upon them. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? So he's not trying to make any excuses here. For we have forsaken your commandments, which you commanded by your servants, the prophets, saying, the land that you are entering to take possession of it is a land impure with the impurity of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations that have filled it from end to end with their uncleanness. Therefore, do not give your daughters to their sons, neither take their daughters for your sons and never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. So he's not trying to make any empty promises here. You know, he's just simply saying, this is what we did. Lord, do your thing. Verse 13. And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, seeing that you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserved and have given us such a remnant as this, because really he could have destroyed them. Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the peoples who practice these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you consumed us so that there should be no remnant nor any to escape? O Lord, the God of Israel, you are just, for we are left a remnant that has escaped as it is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you because of this. So this entire prayer is based upon the mercy of God. He's not trying to say, we're good, Lord. No, he's like, we're bad. We need your help. Now we'll see a confession here in chapter 10. Well, Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. So I love this here because it shows that Ezra's conviction and Ezra's prayer is what led the people to public confession. So his prayer was actually more effective than any sort of preaching or prophecy from before. And Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra, we have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all these wives and their children. So, aka, we will divorce them. And of course, the children would then stay with the mother. According to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for it is your task, and we are with you. Be strong and do it. Then Ezra arose and made the leading priests and Levites and all Israel take an oath that they would do as had been said. So they took the oath. So notice that it starts with the leaders, the leading priests. Then Ezra withdrew from before the house of God and went to the chamber of Johanan, the son of Eliashib, where he spent the night neither eating bread nor drinking water. So it appears as though he is doing a complete fast here. For he was mourning over the faithlessness of the exiles. And a proclamation was made throughout Judah and Jerusalem to all the returned exiles that they should assemble at Jerusalem. And that if anyone did not come within three days by order of the officials, and the elders, all his property should be forfeited, and he himself banned from the congregation of the exile. So now we see that he is using that authority that was given to him by Artaxerxes. Then all the men of Judah and Benjamin assembled at Jerusalem within the three days. So you see a unified response. It was the ninth month on the 20th day of the month. And all the people sat in the open square before the house of God, trembling because of this matter and because of the heavy rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have broken faith and married foreign women, and so increase the guilt of Israel. Now then, make confession to the Lord, the God of your fathers, and do His will. Separate yourselves from the peoples of the land and from the foreign wives. Verse 12, Then all the assembly answered with a loud voice, It is so, we must do as you have said. But the people are many, and it is a time of heavy rain. We cannot stand in the open, nor is this a task for one day or for two, for we have greatly transgressed in this matter. So the reason why it's going to take some time to be able to figure out who are the people who have married foreign women is likely because they are looking for those women who have refused to turn from their idolatry and turn to the faith. So there are some who intermarried. However, those women turn to the faith and therefore 
they would not be included in this bunch. Verse 14, let our officials stand for the whole assembly. Let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at appointed times, and with them the elders and judges of every city, until the fierce wrath of our God over this matter is turned away from us. Only Jonathan, the son of Asahel, and Jezeah, the son of Tikva, opposed this. Why? I'm not sure. And Meshullam and Shabbatai, the Levite, supported them. I mean, I guess you always have to have somebody who doesn't want to go with the flow. Verse 16. Then the returned exiles did so. Ezra the priest selected men, heads of fathers' houses, according to their fathers' houses, each of them designated by name. On the first day of the tenth month, they sat down to examine the matter. And by the first day of the first month, they had come to the end of all the men who had married foreign women. So this questioning took weeks, just as I was saying before, like it wasn't just a one day affair. Verse 18, now there were found some of the sons of the priests who had married foreign women, Maaseah, Eliezer, Jareb, and Gedaliah, some of the sons of Jeshua, the son of Josadak and his brothers. They pledged themselves to put away their wives and their guilt offering was a ram of the flock for their guilt. Of the sons of Immer, Ani, and Zebediah. Of the sons of Haram, Maaseah, Elijah, Shemaiah, Jehiel, and Uzziah. Of the sons of Pasher, Elioenai, Maaseah, Ishmael, Nathanael, Josabad, and Elisa. Of the Levites, Josabad, Shimei, Kileah, that is Kaleida, Pethahiah, Judah, and Eliezer. Of the singers, Eliashib. Of the gatekeepers, Shalom, Telam, and Uri. And of Israel, of the sons of Perosh, Ramiah, Isaiah, Melchijah, Mejamin, Eliezer, Hashabiah, and Benaiah. Of the sons of Elam, Madaniah, Zechariah, Jehiel, Abdi, Jeremoth, and Elijah. Of the sons of Zatu, Elioenai, Eliashib, Mataniah, Jeremoth, Zabad, and Aziza. Of the sons of Bebai were Jehohanan, Hananiah, Zabai, and Athli. Of the sons of Bani were Meshullam, Malak, Adea, Jashub, Sheel, and Jeremoth. Of the sons of Peath, Moab, Adna, Kilal, Benaiah, Maaseah, Mataniah, Bezalel, Benuai, and Manasseh. Of the sons of Haram, Eliezer, Ishijah, Malchijah, Shemaiah, Shimeon, Benjamin, Malak, and Shemariah. Of the sons of Hashem, Madani, Madada, Zabad, Eliphalet, Jeremiah, Manasseh, and Shimei. Of the sons of Bani, Maadai, Amram, Uel, Benaiah, Bedeah, Keluhai, Benaiah, Miramoth, Eliashib, Madaniah, Madani, Jesu. Of the sons of Binuai, Shimei, Shelemiah, Nathan, Idea, Machnadibai, Shashai, Sherai, Azrael, Shelemiah, Shemariah, Shalom, Amariah, and Joseph. Of Jadai, Joel. Of the sons of Nebo, Jeel, Mattathida, Zabad, Zabina, Jadai, Joel, Benaiah. All these had married foreign women, and some of the women had even born children. So this can be a really sad ending, but the scholars believe that this list of 114 men comprised of less than a half percent of the entire population. And again, these women were unwilling to forsake their gods and submit their lives to the Lord. So therefore, these men of faith were willing to forsake their families in order to get right with God. I mean, that is how serious they were about their relationship with Him. And I imagine that could not have been easy. So heart check. What have you forsaken to make sure you are maintaining your covenant with God? And so from this point on, Ezra will sort of disappear from record for a good 13 years until we meet up with him again in the book of Nehemiah, which we will actually start tomorrow. But until then, we'll take a look at some of our deep dive questions. What are the characteristics of Ezra and how does he inspire you in your daily walk? How does the dangerous journey and Ezra's trust in God along the way strengthen your faith? What does their safe arrival say about God's character? Why was it so important to Ezra to send for Levites? How important is communal fasting and prayer today? And what was the issue with interracial marriage? How can we use this passage to evaluate interfaith marriages today? So, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we are a people who are indeed favored by God. It may not always feel like it, God, but we know your divine hand of protection is upon us. Your provision is on the way, and your redemptive and restorative work is at hand. We know this because the Spirit of God lives within us, and wherever the Spirit is, the kingdom comes. We are kingdom kids. We are a royal priesthood. We are children of the Most High. And when we are within the kingdom, we have the favor of the King. So we thank you for that. 
Help us to see it with clearer eyes and to perceive all that you are doing in our midst. We may have gone through some tough things in our lives, but the best part of that phrase is that we got through it and you brought us through it. We don't have to camp out in it any longer. We can keep walking, so move our feet today. I pray that your word will continually light the path so that we can walk in your footsteps. Lord, continue to teach us your word and may we respond in obedience to it. I pray that we will move beyond storing up knowledge and become doers of your word. May we be living examples of it and help us to understand that when we do that, we are teaching others by example. Not all of us are called into seminary and into traditional teaching from a pulpit, but every one of us is called to teach by the way that we live. So let it be done. We know that you are preparing us all for the next season, so I pray that you will show us what skills need to be sharpened in this time. Where can we improve, Lord? How can we be better? And what can we be intentional about so that we are ready whenever you tap us on the shoulder and send us out into new territory? What an exciting time it is. We want to be movers and shakers in the kingdom. And if the journey ahead looks dangerous, we will simply put on more armor. We will set our hearts to study and continue to sharpen our swords as we stand tall with courage. And when we come out victorious, we will continue to bless you for your steadfast love and favor. There is nothing that we can do apart from you, and we recognize that. And Lord, help us to see and know the commissioning work that has been purposed in heaven by you for us. I pray that we will never neglect the work because we are comfortable in Babylon. I pray that we never let our purpose die out for the sake of wallowing in lethargy. Invigorate us, Lord, to answer the call. If we are struggling with doubt or really need to hone in on our devotion to you, I pray that you will move our hearts to do a fast. And in the denial of the physical, we know that you will begin to stir things up in the spirit spiritual. Humble our hearts, Lord, and show us how to pray. We don't ever want to treat you like a fast food drive through where we only come when we get a little hunger pang. But instead, we want to seek you before we are famished so that there is a constant supply of fuel as we depend on you for our strength. We know that as we begin our journey with you, there will be robbers, there's going to be bandits along the way, because that's the enemy's whole purpose, to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to pick us off. So we again ask for your divine protection. Help us to protect and steward well the gifts that you have entrusted us with as we make that trek. I pray that we will not only end up with the same measure, but instead may we increase the gifts to overflowing through good stewardship. I pray that we will have good integrity in everything we do and that we will prove ourselves to be faithful stewards of everything you have given to us. We truly are a blessed people. For you have given us far greater than we could ever deserve. And we thank you, Lord, for showing us the importance of prayer today, especially in response to collective or communal sin. Instead of pointing fingers or trying to draw attention to everyone else's faults and failures, I pray that we will instead be a people of prayer, taking responsibility for our own sin and not trying to use others' sin as a mask to hide or dilute our own. And if there is anything we need to put away or forsake in order to get right with you, God, please remind us or show us where we may have compromised. I pray that we will confess those things to you and to anyone else we may have hurt in the process. May we do your will and turn and begin moving in the other direction. That's what true repentance is. If we don't turn from it, our confession will be done in vain. And we thank you for the mercy that you continually bestow upon us, no matter how far we may wander. Thank you, Lord, that we can come boldly to the throne room of grace if we come with sincerity and humility. So I pray that we never take this for granted. We don't want to waste your grace or use it as an excuse to continue down a path that will ultimately destroy us. So I pray that the moment we feel a conviction in our spirits, that we will be appalled and ashamed the way that Ezra was. We won't sit in the shame, but may it move us to repentance. Thank you for setting us free from the slavery of sin and giving us footing within your holy place. The only thing we want to be a slave to is you. So please forgive us for anything that has forsaken your word. Cleanse us from all impurity and make us clean once again. I pray that when we stand up from this prayer today, we will be revived and renewed so that we can walk away unashamed. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. 
None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because He loves us, and He wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive Him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing, and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die, but I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.